Hi guys, my life has been falling apart. Um, actually it's the exact opposite. Things have been getting a lot better, and if you've noticed, uh, I have started posting content on this channel again, and I'm gonna continue to do so in a, in a regular manner. The plan is to do at least two videos a month um, on top of the uh, bi-monthly streams I'm gonna be doing, which are basically these interviews, but live. But that being said, I have an editor, I have plans to make sure that these things are actually being put down and I have the time to make that happen too. I could go into why my life is uh, going through a lot of changes right now, but I think I'll make another video about that or something. Uh, until then, I just wanted to let you guys know there's going to be more content. I'm going to be working my butt off. I have an editor named Blue. He's really fantastic. Say hi to Blue. Hi, Blue. And uh, I, if you want to see more of this stuff, then stick the fuck around because it's going to be up. All right, okay, I love you. Bye. Hey, kids. <laughs> It's Coca, back with another Dope Talk, a short podcast for hosting people with dope talents. Today we've got Sir Billion, connoisseur of game development and cute dogs. You want to say hi, Sir Billion? Hey guys, yeah, I'm apparently a connoisseur now, so I'm the expert of dogs. You can ask me any questions about dogs and I'll answer about a quarter of them. A quarter? <laughs> I mean, you could also lie to them and pretend like you're, you're the expert here. I mean, I'm putting you on the spot, but TBH, I don't think it's like... If you sound confident enough with something, most most times out of 10, people are going to believe you. Yeah, I can tell you all about all 14 dogs. All 14 of them. <laughs> all 14. <laughs> all f okay. Um, not not proving the case point I just made. But that being said, uh, so Sir Billion over here is uh, the lead developer, as I was told, um, at least the team leader of, uh, of a cool project called Breeze in the Clouds, or at least it's, it's along that line. But they've been working on this project for, I think, a year, if not a little bit more than two, like a year and two, maybe? So, um, kind of an embarrassing story here. Um, I, think I would love most, to hear it. I think most people have found out about the project um, within the last two years, mostly because I started doing a, a good job at marketing it. Um, but I've actually been working on Breeze for... And an embarrassing amount of time. So I think about six six or seven years on and off. Ooh. I mean, to be fair, though, you think about uh, other devs who do, like, independent projects. Because, like, when you're doing this on your own time, it takes a lot longer, especially if it's not, like, something financially full-time you can get to. Right. But that being said, you look at other developers like Cuphead, who literally mortgaged their uh, house again just to, like... <laughs> <laughs> make that gamble so i get you it takes time and i i wouldn't feel ashamed about that um do you want to talk a little bit about that project though like what that is to you yep so uh breeze has pretty much been a very integral part to or within my game dev experience um i actually went to school for game development and um breeze was kind of like this it's almost like a joke here a pet project um from back when i pretty much didn't know anything about game development Along with a bunch, of, a bunch of other dumb ideas I had that I really thought I could pull off, like making an MMO, which is a good idea for anyone who's in a stream. Make sure your first project's an MMO. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they are always successful. But uh, anyway, um, yeah, so I've been work. I, I've essentially been working on Breeze um, on and off since uh, my college years. More so within the last few years, I guess I've gotten to the level where um, I can uh, competently run a project. I think some of my team members, if they're in the chat, can confirm that or deny it. I don't know. I won't look at the chat for the answer, so don't worry about it. You've got some people <laughs> coming in to like destroy you. They're like, sorry, you're not actually the project is, lead. This is our project. We've kicked you off secretly. Sorry, dude. He is a liar. <laughs> it, was actually, uh, it was actually Sir Million, not Sir Billion, who is the lead of Breeze in the Clouds. Oh yeah, sorry guys, I screwed this up. Dope talks over. But that being said, <laughs> I wanted to ask, like, so this is this is definitely a passion project of yours. Did you always know it would be in the same direction that you have it now, or has it kind of shifted around over time? Oh, of course. This is Breeze version six. So um, <laughs> uh, Breeze actually started <laughs> off if, um, as a three D platformer, um, mostly because when I first started um, using Unity, which is the game engine I'm uh, building Breeze in, there was a essentially like a platformer tutorial. Uh, I forgot what, what the tutorial was even called. It was like a alien um, thing, and it kind of just stepped you through the process of making very simple things in Unity. So I was like, okay, cool. I like 3D platformers, I think, right? Um, so I was like, okay, well, Breeze is going to be uh, this random platformer where you're a corgi who is just jumping on clouds and climbing towers and boom, no lore. But within kind of just, like I said, working on Breeze since like forever um breeze has gone through a lot of different iterations 
I actually have some of the videos up somewhere on my YouTube channel. Hopefully they're listed still. I might have done that recently. I, I, I wanna I wanna interject and ask, why specifically corgis, clouds, and uh fighting? Uh good question. So I can definitely answer the cloud one. Um I've always been interested in meteorology. Um I'm not really sure what the catalyst to that was. I think I spent most of my childhood in Georgia where we pretty much had weather that was like, okay, we're going to be sunny right now. And then we're going to be rainy right now. Um, <laughs> and I just kind of just got interested in weather just from watching the weather channel <laughs> more than most children did, um, as well as animal, cha uh, animal planet, animal channel, animal. That's not ignorant here. <laughs> animal channel. Yeah. I just, I turned, I turned no, cable fine. off, so I don't even remember. Um, the show about animals. Yep. Yeah. Animals learning about them. Boom. Cartoon Network. What's that? Damn. So, um, but Corgi, that's a good question. <laughs> um, it's hard to say why I ultimately chose Corgi. Um, here's some deep lore. So Breeze used to be a uh, Corgi husky mix. Um, so if you happen to somehow find any of Breeze's old art, maybe you're in a Discord channel or something, hint, hint. Um, You'll see that he had like random spots and different patterns that weren't like one to one for Corgi. Um, and then I kind of just eliminated the husky part. So yeah, deep lore ends there. Deep lore ends there. So uh, with this Breeze project though, like has it mostly been an independent thing that kind of moved into a team project or like how did you get where you are with it right now? So it did start off um, pretty much as an independent project. Uh, it was just me kind of just goofing around in Unity. Um, my roommate who's, um, or my roommate from college, who's now my co-partner for my business, Stormy Nights, um, we basically went to school together and as he became a bit more competent in the programming aspects, he was like, oh, I can help you out. So it was us two working on basically the first two or three iterations of Breeze. Um, and when I say the iterations, it was more so not knowing what we were doing, writing a bunch of code and making a bunch of assets and then none of them working. <laughs> Um, and it was kind of just us for at least the first couple like years. Um, then ultimately I ended up, um, reaching out to a couple of, um, other individuals. Um, one of them is actually uh, a composer on the team now who I've known since we basically won a contest together, uh, back in like, what was that? 2011, I think 2012. What was the contest? Uh, oh man, uh, more deep lore. So there was this, um, <laughs> <laughs> there was this got you. contest called the Lenovo Tech Trip, um, which was funny. It was a I randomly saw an ad for it on Facebook, so I was like, okay, I'm just going to enter this contest. And I can't remember all the things we had to do, but essentially, I was going around to a bunch of strangers' doors and saying, "Hey, can you vote for me on this Facebook page so I can like win a bunch <laughs> of stuff?" And that was pretty much my entire uh, apartment complex. I did that in. Um, and then ah, yes, the early days of the internet, right? <laughs> Facebook challenges mattered, you know? Yeah. I think you had to like, ex uh, like it was one of those Facebook apps. So you had to like, give up all your privileges or permissions or something to random app, whatever. Um, yeah. Like just release your social security number so you can vote <laughs> on my project, please. Thank yeah, you. <laughs> yeah. I need, I need this laptop very bad, but yeah. So I ended up becoming i think it was the top 10 or top 20 and we had to make a video and do something else and um i was like oh crap i might actually win this <laughs> so um i did the video and everything and um pretty much the day they were going to announce that who the winners were they actually called me when i was closing at work and i freaked out and cried and then i called my boss who just left and cried some more and was goofy on the phone and stuff like that um <laughs> So to cut it short, we basically got to go on a trip where we visited four different companies around the U.S. Uh, Lenovo, that's cool, dude. Uh, Adobe, Intel, and Namco Bandai or Bandai Namco. I mixed the order up, and we got a bunch of cool prizes like a laptop and a surround sound system, and some games and some other stuff. Yeah, that was that was fun. Sounds like a good experience overall. I mean, like, so with this project, though, do you kind of have a clear idea of where you're going with it right now? Nope, not at all. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> not so. Oh, no. Um, I have a pretty um, good plan as far as what I want to do with Breeze. Um, some things I don't want to mention right now in the chat. Um, yeah, absolutely. But a pretty solid idea of, like, you know, Breeze and all the different characters in the world um, and the overall direction of the game. 
Hell yeah, dude. So, like, I'm I'm interested, though. Like, you've been doing game development for a while now. Like, you said you were interested in being a meteorologist. What kind of pushed you in the direction of game development specifically? So, um, funny enough, my high school years were really interesting because I decided I wanted to be a billion things just so to match with my name. Um, Everybody. <laughs> right. So, I was going to... Originally, I was actually going to get into photography, which is kind of a hobby that I still have. But I, I, I figured the arts was the thing I was going to do. Um, I always got in trouble in class for drawing. I don't even know why you should get in trouble for drawing in class because I was a, a B plus student, but whatever. Uh, I could go on for, for years about why <laughs> school is, is bad for people, but <laughs> right. to keep it focused. Keep it, to keep it focused. Yeah. So I was always drawing in class. I actually made this very embarrassing comic that I still have. <laughs> um, I was really big into anime and stuff like that. Um, and the whole animal planet thing started happening there. Um, what else happened in Billion's life? Oh yeah, so art, um, uh, photography, graphic design was like a tenth grade thing, and I was like, hey, I'm totally gonna go, go I'm totally gonna go to art school. I'm gonna go to art art institute, and I'm just gonna be a something that makes money with art. I don't know, but I also ended up going to the summer program where they were teaching Visual Basic, um, and apparently I was very good at it um, because Ooh. the second week of that. That program, they actually wanted me to assist in teaching some of the other students. So I was like, okay, programming is cool. Um, I suck at math, but isn't apparently that, I haven't had to cool use it though? yet. <laughs> like, like when people like see what you do and they actually acknowledge your talent and they're like, hey, let me uh, help you with that and push you in a good direction. Like that's, that's always my favorite stuff. Like at least when I was in school, like I had people who would, who would notice that I was decent at something and say, hey, I want to do something with that, you know? <laughs> Right, and I think that's a really that's good cool. thing like to acknowledge when somebody has the potential for something to help them, you know, kind of foster it. I mean, that kind of yeah. happened with me with graphic design. I didn't truly think that was something I wanted to do until like my uh, graphic arts teacher pushed me um, into it. Um, and then that was just like my thing. Like, yeah, yeah, graphic design. I'm the guy at school who does this and photography and a bunch of other random things. So specifically with that, um, what exactly are you doing on this project? So I know you're a team lead, but are you, are you doing some of the graphic art? Are you doing some of the, uh, the coding? Like what's, what's your role specifically? So some of my responsibilities include talking to my Australian artist at some ungodly hour um, and making sure yep. that he's doing everything. Um, <laughs> but aside from that, yeah, so I am doing um, majority of the programming for the project, um, pretty much doing task delegation. Um, I'm doing a little bit of animation. Not as much. I kind of touch a little bit of everything just to make sure that I can get enough information to my teammates so that they can do a better job than I would. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So well, that's that's the whole thing is like when you when you start to uh, understand that there are other people who maybe can do your job a little bit better than you and you have that sense of trust, delegation becomes such a valuable asset, especially like, you know, in some of the projects I've worked on. And this is even with this uh, this whole program, I, I found, wow, I can do a lot of this myself, but that takes mm -hmm. time. And there are people who can do that better. So let me find an editor who can. You know. <laughs> so right. I'm sure I'm sure over time you've you've learned that like other people can actually help you, especially if you know, like. Like that they're they're willing to put in the time and you can trust them like that's that's a hard thing to do for me honestly. It, it, it is yeah and it's something that honestly took me maybe at least four years to really start thinking about um i mean because i've always kind of been like kind of putting too much on myself in terms of like okay i'm gonna do this and this and that and this and that and that way i can have control and learn stuff and blah 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 but just from kind of within my limited life experience so far um, I learned after a while that th that could potentially become unhealthy, um, and I will admit that I've adopted a lot of bad habits through that. Um, I do this thing called um, sleeping every now and then. I thought it was optional. Apparently, it's something that humans need to do. <laughs> so I'm trying to work took, on that. It took me a minute to get that. I'm like, what do you... <laughs> I do this thing, you know, where, where I close my eyes and I actually yeah, so try I, to I, rest like, I like instead close of, my you know... eyes somewhere. And then, like, I open my eyes, and I'm like, okay, why is it sunny outside? Like, so I think that's, like, <laughs> what my... What happened? That must be my um, secret talent or something, my um, Keki Genkai or something. I can close my eyes and time goes by. This could be me ignorantly quoting someone, but, like, I believe Leonardo <laughs> da Vinci had, had the, uh, the infamous saying of, if I, if I could be awake my whole life, I would do so much more. Which is true, but at the same time, like, you gotta take care of your body. Like, you can't just be, you know, killing yourself, because your output's gonna stink at some point, you know. It's good to have those binges. Like, for instance, uh, when I was working on this <laughs> particular podcast, 
I uh, I zone the fuck in. Uh, just just specifically for getting the art assets and getting like the uh, research done. And it's like it's good when you have those moments of like dedication and clarity. But it's also really good when you don't do that twenty four seven and you take care of yourself because it turns out that actually being healthy can can be a very productive thing for your work. Oh yeah, <laughs> you know. I mean, embrace that three a.m. fuel every now and then. You'd just be surprised with the ideas that come out. Like. You might come up oh, with this great. idea of like a corgi like in the clouds and stuff. I'm just kidding. I think that was actually like a 7 p.m. bus ride dream. Yeah. Which is great. I love those sorts of moments. But um, my question <laughs> is, is what specifically made you want to stick with this idea, right? Because you, you probably get a lot of them where you're like, oh, this is, you know, a flight of fancy. This is something that I want to get into. I mean, everybody's kind of had their own projects. Like what made you say that this is the project that you wanted to focus like six years of your life on? Um, hmm. So hard question, right? yeah, hard question. <laughs> yeah. So I have a very bad habit of not letting things go. <laughs> Ooh. yeah but no I so I, I i'm i think one of my strong traits is that like i want to finish things that i start um i mean there's plenty of smaller like concepts that come about um and i kind of tinker and do them anyway but i see breeze as kind of like the catalyst in my journey of wanting to get into game dev so i feel like that you know i need to complete it right yeah, I've also, you know, I've included a lot of people um, on the project um, and obviously a lot of my friends, family, you know, they are like, hey, he started this thing and it's apparent that, you know, he's, I guess it's apparent that he's getting better at things because if I show you some stuff from like five or ten years ago, you're gonna be like, oh, OK, yeah, mm -hmm. cringe. But, I feel that. But yeah, it's so so it's like I, I, I have to finish it. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I think one of the best things you said about that is, like, once you get people on a project, I think it, like, kind of really puts it into a very serious space. Because, like, you know, personal game development, even personal art, mm -hmm. it's like you can, you can be the judge of saying it's done, right? Yeah. But when it comes to, uh, like, other people who believe in your, you know, work and believe in your team leadership and believe in the stuff that you're doing... It becomes a lot more serious, and to put something like that off, like especially after so much time, it's like, oh man, like you know, is this is this wasting time to get away from it, or is this like actually um, a good cutoff? That's a hard that's a hard position to be in because I've had a few projects like that myself where I've been like specifically just very set on making them happen, and then suddenly one day it's like, no. But it, I think it's cool that you like you're sticking with your guns and you have a good idea because like right now you're you're working with the Patreon right for like that specifically to help funding for that, I guess. Yep. So the Patreon was kind of a idea that came about um, as a means to help kind of supplement the budget of the game. Because um, pretty much up until now, I've been completely uh, funding the project on my own. With that being said, that obviously means I have limits in terms of how much work I can get done during a certain time. Um, on top of the fact that I, you know, do work a full time job. So yeah, the idea of the, of the for the Patreon was that I didn't want to launch a kickstarter specifically for the game yet um until i feel confident that i can produce um a demo or something to that audience that would make them feel confident in you know backing the project which is it's a really smart idea right because you uh you know that you should give people your best content straightforward. A lot of people confuse this on Patreons or at least kickstarter is what i'm trying to say. A yeah. lot of people confuse the idea that quantity is like something that'll make people turned on but like in terms of actually a good presentation have a good succinct idea even like a good like a uh, first project that you can put out for people to like play around with um and that gives them the confidence that you're doing a great job and like from what i've seen over your project for the last year that i've been following it it's like i know that you're putting a lot of love into what you're doing and like if you sit down and make a good kickstarter i think people are bound to like pay attention or at least have an eye for it because a lot of the ones that i've noticed failing are the ones where they kind of have somewhat of an idea what they're doing and they kind of have somewhat of like a like a voice with it but like a lot of uh kickstarters that go well are ones with a lot of confidence and a lot of like competence you know a lot of uh very well built together things that make like a good project and that's hard for people to discern you know making a kickstarter is it's a it's an experience. I haven't made one myself, but I've been watching a lot of them and kind of seeing what works and what doesn't work. Yeah, and I've kind of been um, using this opportunity of not launching a Kickstarter to kind of see, you know, what things work, you know, what things obviously don't work. Um, luckily, I've kind of got one thing out the way that I feel a lot of projects aren't as good at, um, and that's kind of communicating with the audience. 
Um, I've opened up as many avenues as I can to allow people to hear about, you know, where the project is, um, as well as reaching out to me if they feel like it. Um, I may not, you know, get to everyone right away, but I try to answer questions that I feel aren't, you know, spoiler territory or things I, you know, have answered 87 times, but, uh, there's an FAQ yeah, I mean, on the have, website have... for that now. So boom, don't worry about that. <laughs> I was literally going to say the FAQ. <laughs> That's great. I don't know. Like, I think you're on point though. Like having some involvement, at least in the community, I think really speaks, uh, leagues for developers. Cause you know, I know it's, it's, it takes a lot away from, um, what it is that you're working on when you spend time on other things like uh, community management, mm-hmm. but a lot of it, it's like, oftentimes you'll get feedback. You don't honestly, uh, think about. And it, some of it might be garbage, but there might be like a little nugget every now and then. You're like, wow, I never thought of it this way. I've, I've been dealing with that myself when it comes to like my art. I'll talk to people all the time. And sometimes someone has the balls to say something that might not be something I want to hear. But sometimes it's like, wow, I really maybe should have considered that at some point. Or like, I don't know how I didn't even think about that to start with, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, even within my own team, um, I mean, hopefully they aren't intimidated by me. I don't sound intimidating i don't think no you sound like a very well put together person like yeah i i like your vibe you you got a very you know keen sense of uh delegation and also just consideration and that's something i i always fucking love seeing in creators is when they actually are able to have conversations versus kind of walling themselves off and saying <laughs> yeah you know i'm competent but you know <laughs> i'm so glad you can't see me blushing right now oh little baby <laughs> little so little, like i'm baby yeah <laughs> Sir Bill- okay, this is also something I wanted to mention. But Sir Billion, that's his actual name is Sir Billion. And I think that's the coolest fucking shit I've ever heard in my life. Like, <laughs> your, your parents were cool for doing that to you. I don't know if you feel the same way, but... Right, yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been a fun name to have. Um, I learned how to spell it in, I think, second grade, finally. Yeah, you, you can only spell your name, like, one way. Oh, man, that was fun. Oh, man, I was a terrible elementary school student. But anyway, yeah, um... It's funny when I when I speak to people like over the mic and whatnot um, to have conversations and they think that I'm referring to my my gamer tag or my discord name. I'm like, oh, yeah, by the way, that is that is my legal name. (laughs) I mean, I I didn't believe it. That is what I've been called for 28 years. (laughs) <laughs> My first experience actually with Sir Billion was actually at TFF this year. Um, I was having an okay time, but like, I think they like reached out to me or somebody from their development team reached out to me and they're like, yeah, let's like talk for a bit. And so they, they came over with like their whole team and I was like, oh man, this is like a whole squad. Holy shit. Squad up. Which is like, yeah, like, like what I'm saying is like, it's cool when you have a bunch of people that uh, believe in your project and are willing to put in the time despite like, I'd say a lack of funding. And I'm not saying that, you know, people should work for exposure, but it's cool when people are willing to believe in something that it is that you're, uh, you know, working your ass off on and they're willing to put in the same kind of degree, you know, of uh, participation and love. That's a, that's a community project, but it's also a very focused community project. So this is going to be a hard question, right? Uh Uh-oh. Let me. Let me get my glass of water real quick. I'm just kidding. Okay. All right, yeah, I'm, I'd good. Love, I'm good. I'd love to get your glass of water. <laughs> so with game dev specifically, um, I know it's really hard to find people who are competent uh, and to find people who are focused and not just like they're, I don't want to say for the clout, but like for the uh, for the experience of being on a game dev project. Have you have you ever had to deal with like making the cut with people or is that like something that you, you've just kind of found the right people to, you know, constantly bring on to projects like that it's kind of a mixture of both and i think a lot of this also comes just from the experience of you know dealing with um people in both real life and through the web um i mean throughout my time working on breeze um i mean i can honestly say that um in any capacity i probably interface with at least 50 or more people um yeah obviously i mean a lot of people will come by when they see your project you know (laughs) Right. Um, and I mean, starting off, admittedly, it was very difficult um, knowing where to find people and knowing, you know, what to look for, uh, as well as the fact that, you know, in earlier stages of Breeze's development, I wasn't as confident in, you know, what I wanted the game to be um, and how and how and what assets need to be made and things of that nature. Um, I also at the time didn't have things like style guides, directions or, you know, very a very clear visual direction on, on things because that's predominantly what a lot of the people that I work with are, um, you know, they make the assets for the game, right? Well, yeah, but to, to me, it's like you have uh, a sense of how game projects are working. And so I, I met somebody like a developer, right, who told me a lot about the stuff that was like the interior part of it. And I'm like, mm-hmm. holy shit, how do you even know any of that stuff? But this is this is the brilliant part is that 
you don't need to have all that up front. Like your mm-hmm. experience over time is like the buildup for that. A lot of people make them, I think, the very common mistake of uh, assuming they should know everything before they even get started. But oftentimes in my experience, um, I, I think it's a lot better to make stuff and then learn like what it is you're doing wrong over time because it yeah. makes it a lot less of like a like an upfront task. But it also means that you're working on it because people have these this idea and it's really silly to me. They have this idea that it's like wrong for them to pursue their projects until it is they have all the skills that they wish they had, you know, when in reality, getting those skills is literally just the process of actually working on something. And it might be garbage. It might be awful. But like, right. That is what develops those skills, you know? No, I agree completely with that. And I mean, I'm like I, I mentioned earlier, I'm one of those people who are like, yeah, I'm going to make this game. And like, I'm literally in college not knowing how to program yet. <laughs> I mean, I knew how to program, but I didn't know how to program like to the capacity of being able to really do something. Um, and one of the things that actually helped me out, and I recommend this for anyone um, watching the stream, uh, is to participate in game jams. I've done like like 10 of them. And what game jams are, and I'm going to do a very terrible job here at explaining it. It's like it's it's essentially like this micro marathon of developing a game um, after being given a particular theme. So a lot of the game jams I did were either 48 or 72 hour jams, where basically we're told something like, I can't actually remember any of the themes that I did, but I'll, I'll just make one up here, right? Um, yeah. The Oh, I remember one. Uh, Beauty is in the eye of the beholder or something like that. I think that was the very first game jam I did. Um, and so everyone was like, I'm going to make an Ouroboros game. Um, I'm going to make a mirror reflection game. Um, I don't even remember what my game was now that I think about it. Uh, but the, the fun part about that is that you sit there and you kind of go through a lot of these different, um, I don't know, I guess we call them like mental shifts because you're like, huh, how do I interpret this thing? Okay, I interpret it this way. How can I turn this into a game? Cool. I can make this type of game. Can I do that in 72 hours? Hmm, let's get started. And then you realize that you just spent nine hours just doing rudimentary game design. You spend the next, probably half of the next day just coding things and like, crap, how does this work? How do game developers do this? And then you get kind of in that last stretch where you're like, okay, I'm going to start making compromises. Um, And you start trying to look at what you have and seeing, okay, how can I make this look good very quickly? And just going through that process, many times kind of it helps you hone in on things like um managing scope uh which is oof man that's like your worst enemy in a game project by the way oh yeah no no not not being able to tell like how much is too much with the project you know right and it also gives you the opportunity to think of different facets that you may not have uh thought of like perhaps you got into game development because you know a little bit of code right yeah you may not know, like, how do I import assets? Why is, you know, a PNG work this way, but a JPEG doesn't? Hmm, why do I need a sprite sheet? What's managing memory? Like, all these different things kind of just happen because you run into these scenarios where you're like, uh, what do I do? So I got a good question. Are game jams typically physical, or are they more of, like, an online thing? Because I've always been curious about that. I see people do these, like, game jams pretty frequently, and I would assume that people getting together, like, in a physical environment would either be expensive or kind of hard to do. So I, my very first game jam was a physical one, um, and then the two after that were also physical. But the other seven that I did were actually remote. Global game jams were the ones that I started off doing. I actually felt like I got more distracted. So we were doing random things like it would be nine o'clock and we're like, yo, we should totally buy a sleeping bag because um, the trip, excuse me, the trip home will take off four hours of whatever. I'm just making up a number yeah. there. So then we end up going to Walmart at like 11 o'clock trying to find a sleeping bag. And so we end up spending f- four or five hours doing that because now we're like, hey, let's go to Waffle House. And so it's like two in the morning and you're at Waffle House and now you're like super tired and then you end up sleeping more because you're just burnt out and then you wake up and you're like okay cool sleeping um, at the waffle house <laughs> yeah sleep- well i think we so i think we made it to the car but yeah like um <laughs> another fun thing about doing game gens physically is that you get to meet a lot of different people and you get to kind of see like their chaos yeah, exactly um because like after day two like it it honestly looks like a hot mess in these in these locations because everyone's tired everyone's frustrated everyone's like we need to hurry up they're like wait how are we going to record footage for a game just like different things and you get to see kind of like a lot of different people's team dynamics 
a lot of teams are built like that. Like that's that's the first time a lot of those people ever ever met each other. That's what I was going to cut into. Is I think it's like really cool, like hearing that these game devs get on a more personal level. Because like oftentimes I just assume it's like a you know professional kind of thing. But the fact that you're like going out and getting food together, and you might think it's wasting time, but at the same time it's like team building when you really start to understand how it is other people are feeling, and you might make those kinds of connections that otherwise. You might not have. I'm a very nervous person, right? <laughs> so oftentimes, like, when I when I try to network with people, I'm always, like, not thinking about it as a networking opportunity. I'm just like, oh, this is someone I got to work with. I guess I got to do this is for a project. But I think mm-hmm. it's really cool hearing that, like, a lot of these situations are ones uh, that you came into and you're very social with them. Because I think doing the opposite of that and treating it as just a job or just a game jam or just something is almost counterintuitive because the people aspect of it, the part mm-hmm. that like really makes it count is, is incredibly important, right? You actually have to have to know people to be able to trust them. And oftentimes like when you bring out that inner quality from them, you'll get some pretty good results. Yep. And I've met a lot of friends ironically through game jams. One being that I'm always a freaking overachiever when I do these things. <laughs> Um, but the rest is just, you know, like like you said, just being social about it. Um, going to cons, understanding that everyone's kind of like, crap, how are we going to make this game? Um, <laughs> sometimes getting advice from people. And a lot of times you may see a lot of these same people at other jams. And then you're like, hey, I remember you last year. You're the guy who made the game with the balloons that like exploded into kittens or something like that. I think there was fire involved. Yeah, right. And you you meet them and you're like, holy, holy crap. I had no idea that you actually would have worked on something like just this good, right? Yeah. I don't know. It's 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 just cool. Like I for me, I've I've seen a lot of game jam projects, but like I've actually never kind of like understood the inside of them. And I personally, I would have all expected them to be like a uh, sleep deprivation. Well, not even just sleep deprivation. I worked on an animation jam for once, you know, it was like a few years ago. And to me, it was a physical oh, thing, but it was it was also paid for. Like I was I was there because uh, the school decided, wow, yeah, let's fund uh, travel and lodging for for these kids because they're they're, you know, trying to represent our school and stuff like that. I can't imagine what it's like. I'm guessing a lot of these ones for you were like local, right? Yeah, the, yeah, the first two were pretty local. So some of the people that I saw um, went to either my school or corresponding schools. Um, some of them were in the local, um, uh, what was it? The G- GGDA. This was back when I was in Georgia, the, uh, Game Developers Association. Yeah. Which is, which is dope. Yeah. So we, we, we'd run into each other during different functions and such. I will say that there are people that I, I, I still reach out to that I've met through in game jams, I follow them on Twitter. They follow me on Twitter. Boom. With game development, are there any particular moments where you feel like it's, uh, it slows down for you or there's kind of a snag that you're not particularly fond of? Oh, yeah, that happens every week. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so especially knowing that ga- uh, that Bree started off as kind of a project that had a very loose concept, um, I would say within the last, honestly, two to three years, I feel Bree's direction has uh, matured to a point where um, I'm confident in where it's going, as well as hopefully my team are confident as where it's going. <laughs> but, I mean, even, like, things that you won't even realize become problems um, until you run into them. Like I ran into an issue, I think over the weekend actually, um, cause I recently actually reprogrammed a lot of the, um, uh, gameplay related physics for Breeze so that Breeze could do a little more int- interesting things with the environments that he are in. Not realizing that after I started throwing in a lot of enemies that, um, have animations now, uh, that I could not actually collide with them. Oh. And this wasn't something that I was thinking of while I was reprogramming the stuff. Cause I'm like... My focus here is to make sure Breeze can do this thing on this thing. And then I drop in one of the Ragoon enemies and he's like, oh yeah, by the way, um, I'm walking right past you. So would would you say uh, game testers are part of that project for you? Or would you say that's kind of something that you often find for yourself when you, whenever you're testing? So a lot of that stuff is stuff that I typically find because I've, I've only recently started distributing builds to some of my patrons. Yeah. Um, a lot of those actually being physics builds. And ironically, um, I think only one or two of them, what, one or two of the rooms in those builds had an enemy in it. Which, which let, me, let me interject real quick. That's really cool that you actually um, are giving your patrons something like that tangible. Because that's, that's crazy trust right there, you know? Yeah, so I put myself in the spotlight here by deciding that I was going to have Breeze basically kind of follow this um, open development thing. Um, where I mean, if you go to my website now, I literally have a um, 
a chart on the bottom of the page that kind of gives an idea of project estimates of where we are in certain areas. Um, but also kind of just through my Patreon and even my blog, because um, most almost all of the posts that I put on my Patreon are public so that people can see them. I just want to allow the opportunity for people to kind of see some insights of like just development or like random things that I encounter or, hey, uh, here's some characters and this is kind of what to expect when you see them in the game and stuff like that. Um, and I, I found that a lot of people actually kind of like that. Wow. Surprise. But it also keeps me in the practice of kind of just documenting like, what, what did I do this week or this month? Because sometimes when you work on something for a very long time and things aren't, you know, where you think they should be, you tend to forget how much you have done. And just kind of being able to look through my devlogs and saying, man, I can't believe in a month I managed to do X and Y. It makes you feel like that you're getting somewhere. Because otherwise, you know, when things aren't going where you want them to go, you're like, yeah, I'm a failure. Nothing's happening. <laughs> You get that imposter syndrome, or if that's even the term. Not even, not even just that, but just like the feeling of, is this a project that's worth spending all this time on? Because like, you know, for me even, just like with my art career, it's like I can never, ever tell whether or not it's something that like spending so much time on over the last, what, 10, 15 years of my life has come to some sort of good point. And it's like, wow, uh, I really have to ask my, my question, you know, to myself about that. But it's good when you have outside uh, perspective on your situation, not only through like, say, patrons or like people who like uh, casually follow your art, but the people who I would say are your friends, your your family. I mean, you know, in my sense of saying family, I'm talking more about the people who I consider really close. But yeah, it's cool when you have people who can kind of support that idea and i'm not saying like in a false sense of like oh you're doing so great but like people who have seen the amount of work you put into it and say that you're gonna do fine it might just be a reassurance but sometimes but it's always really nice when you have people who believe in what it is you're doing and like what it is that you're gonna be capable of doing in the future because otherwise <laughs> i'd be sitting here like i don't know if I'm, i don't know if i'm actually gonna go anywhere <laughs> will i ever become the hokage tune in next week will i <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sorry, guys. Stream is over. Uh, <laughs> Sir Billion ruined it. <laughs> Talking about Naruto. I can't even deal with you right now. Um, so oh, this man. is a hard question, right? Um, balancing oh, another and one? gameplay. Okay. Balancing and gameplay. Like, have you ever considered, this is a dumb, redundant question, but like in terms of considering it, like how often is it that you're like, wow, my idea is either stupid busted or stupid uh, undeveloped. Like what is, what is your kind of stance on that? So that happens more frequently than you would think. Um, and a lot of it is because the, in the nature of game development, a lot of times you're working on a lot of different facets. And sometimes you bring those different facets together and you're like, okay, I got this stuff now. And then you kind of have the opportunity to test things. And you're like, oh crap, is this going to be fun? Um, <laughs> and I mean, I, and I've, I mean, I've encountered that a few times just this year, um, just with certain things finally being integrated. But then sometimes you get to a certain point where things start to look good and you're like, oh man, okay, cool. My ideas work, are working. Um, but yeah, in the nature of game development, things change. Um, sometimes you're adding stuff. Sometimes you're removing stuff. Sometimes things are good. And then you hit a block that you realize will affect more things than you would think. Over the weekend, I had the opportunity to um, kind of put in some placeholder um, combat sprites in the game. Right. Um, after basically having a lot of combat code in existence for like a year, not being fully utilized, but actually kind of being able to see Breeze knock um, my character Soto around in 18 different directions was like, oh man, <laughs> I can't wait to balance this. Uh, <laughs> uh, as well as kind of just introducing like, okay, well now I'm going to add in multiple enemies and see how broken Breeze is. And just seeing that and seeing Breeze being able to do everything that he can do without any limit makes me realize, okay, I need to limit this guy. Well, yeah, because you want you want your main character to feel cool, right? But you also want to be able to make the the player feel like they're challenged. Because oftentimes when I'm playing like betas or something, like Risk of Rain Two is a pretty big one for me right now. Mm -hmm. I'll I'll do a lot of criticism towards. Wow, this mechanic is fun, but it's stupid busted against other like you know things that are going on in this game, or it's like super undeveloped, and and that sucks. You know when you feel like yeah. uh, there's not a good you know sensation of. I'm being challenged, but you're you're not feeling like you're over challenged, like <laughs> Dark Souls. But you know? yeah, I don't know. It's good that you consider these sorts of things because uh, oftentimes when you you have to you know say work with your audience, 
uh, whether or not it's game development, art, music, any of that stuff, it's it's important to consider what it is that's like not only your definition of fun and a good time, but also to like what other people are going to be thinking about it. And it's hard because you have to place your ego right in a, in a little box. You have to think about it as this is what's driving my project because I know I'm competent. But you also have to consider that, wow, maybe other people have input that might really help. And the fact that you're putting yourself out there regarding uh, criticism through little builds of the game that you're giving to other people, that's that's really important. And then, like, I really want to emphasize that is that you should always be open to criticism. Mm-hmm. But criticism can be, like, dangerous in its own sense because... If you take it too seriously, or if you take it as verbatim, you know, because people have some pretty nasty stuff to say sometimes, you're going to be a miserable person. You have to find a good balance between the two in order to, like, make your project float, but also sink. And oftentimes, I think it's up to the uh, the interpretation of the person developing. You know, they're they're the filter between those two things, and... That's that's where confidence comes in. That's that's the whole idea of I'm confident in what I do and I know what I'm doing, but you never want to have that ego, like I said, in the box, just kind of sitting above the shelf. You want to have it kind of in a comfortable middle ground while also mm-hmm. maintaining a lot of what your vision is. Right. And a lot of times when I do receive criticism, and it's not often that I receive criticism that I would deem subjective to a point where it is not very helpful, I guess I'll say. That's probably the best way I could say that. Yeah. More often than not, I get criticism more so on certain things that I'm like, okay, let me process why this individual feels this way about a certain thing, and then perhaps correlate that with some other feedback that other individuals say. So like, for example, a few people mentioned in a build that Breeze feels slippery. And I'm like, okay, what does that mean? When does he feel slippery? (laughs) That's always the best question, though. It's like, what is that? I'm trying to comprehend it, you know? And then I'll get feedback from another another person that says, yeah, Breeze feels really nice until I stop. And I'm like, oh, until I stop. And I'm like, okay, someone says Breeze is slippery. Someone says Breeze feels good until he stops. Oh, he's sliding. Okay. People don't like the fact that Breeze kind of does a bit of a Mario or more so Luigi slide when he stops. But then I'm like, okay, in what areas are they not liking that? And I come to find out there, that there was one specific room in my build where um, people had to jump on this platform in order to get to the other side. And the platform's very small. So sometimes people will want to land on the platform and then kind of wait till it's close enough to the other side before they jump. But if a player stops and lands on a platform, sometimes he'll slide off because there's, you know, lack of friction there. Yikes. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, well, I'm just going to release a build and I'm going to be like, I turn that friction off or on. I'd add a friction. Boom. Science. And then they're like, okay, cool. It's working. Which it's cool to, I guess, think in extremes sometimes, or at least to kind of find like, like what I'm saying is that you as a developer or like other people who are on good, successful game projects, right? They have a sense of being able to listen and to interpret. And sometimes, you know, it might overcompensate for something, but that's like where feedback comes in. The fact that this is, this is the same thing, right? With art, where if you have inspiration from different, uh, different resources specifically, um, it really helps when you factor all of them versus just one person. Because sometimes people, like, you know, they don't mm-hmm. know what they're talking about. But other times, like, they'll have a good definitive, like, uh, idea. And being able to find people with the right words and being able to, like, make that translation right there is is what's important. And I, that's why criticism is great. But you have to take that, <laughs> you know, yeah, you have with... To under- you have to understand the, the... I would say, yeah, understanding the party and understanding things such as frustrations and whatnot because sometimes you may you may seek criticism from a party that probably wouldn't in in any other case even be interested in your game or be interested in the genre of your game so like if i am talking to someone who likes command and conquer or something and i'm like here's my 2d platformer and they're like uh i don't like this i'm like okay why but then you know there's other times where i'm like okay i want to present this in front of what I would think would be my target audience and see how they like it. And if I can at least get that as a bare minimum, okay, the people that I am kind of developing this towards like this, then at least I have a baseline. And then perhaps I can adjust things that may make people who aren't necessarily fond of this genre, maybe they'll be interested because I decided to, and I'm just making something up here, added cooking into the game. You're, you're trying to find ways to make it like your project is its own thing and maybe, you know, it might not be perfect, but it has things that like set its uh, merits outside of what it is that you know, other projects have done before. Yeah. Without keeping it too long, by the way, 
Um, I I guess I should ask you about what your plans for the future are, because you were talking about Kickstarter. Is that something that you're looking into potentially in the future? So a couple of things. Um, I'm actually going to be launching, and this is I'm, this is gonna be a fun one. I'm hoping it actually works <laughs> out. Um, a lot of people have asked about um merch of a lot of different characters. Some jokingly, mm. some being serious. And I tested out making some um, enamel pens that people evidently like because they enter contests and stuff to get them. Um, so I'm actually looking to launch a Kickstarter specifically for some merch of some of the characters of the game. I'm going to be doing that very, very soon. Um, I'm talking within this month or perhaps in the next couple of weeks. That's one of the th uh, things that I'm doing. Uh, I'm also looking towards, and this is a promise that I may not be able to keep here, um, getting a demo that's public. Uh, going out hopefully at the end of the year or the beginning of the next year um, that allow even non-patrons to have the opportunity to kind of see where we are. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of the short term. Hell yeah, dude. Uh, if you have anything that you'd like to say closing out, um, either to the people who've been following your project or the people who are working on it or even people who are just listening right now, what, what exactly is it that you would like to plug or say or you know even just like kind of thank people for? All right, so I guess one of the first things is um, I would really like to thank um, a lot of the patrons that I've had. I, I kind of started off Patreon not really expecting much. Um, I was hoping, I was like, okay, well, maybe maybe this will work out. And if it doesn't, I'll you know close it off. Um, I've been running Patreon for a year, and I've had a lot of devout patrons. Um, a lot of people join a Discord server. Really fun interacting with a lot of the p people there. And I, um, I'm really grateful that a lot of People are actually interested in, you know, um, helping the project out and just generally being interested in it. Also grateful, just, you know, the fact that I even have an audience, um, especially considering how long um, <laughs> I've been working on this project. And, you know, the fact that, you know, it's not, you know, out like a thousand things have been out since I've started Breeze. But um, just knowing that I have an audience and even a team, I, I have a people on my team who've been on the project for four or five years. And um, haven't given me crap about it yet. <laughs> um, and I'm really grateful to them, um, being with me as, you know, I'm working on the project and learning, um, things. Cause I mean, there's plenty of times where I, you know, I've made obvious mistakes, um, decisions just from my inexperience. Um, and they've been able to kind of, you know, chug along and understand. So I'm really grateful to, like I said, both my patrons and my team. If you're interested, um, in checking out my website, if you're not already following it, uh, breezethegame.com. I'm also dropping the uh, Twitter link right now for, for everybody who's interested. For for anybody who found this talk uh, engaging or anybody who's interested in the project uh, Surbillion's been talking about, please go check out that Twitter. Thank you, guys. Um, you'll be able to find my Patreon there. You'll be able to find the blog. Um, I actually just built a brand new website uh, a few weeks back. So it's all pretty and easy to customize. And yeah, I think that's about it. Thank you. Um, especially cool, thank dude. you for having me. No, I, I appreciate you coming on. You had a lot of really, I think, inspirational, insightful stuff to say about like the whole field of game development. Because I know it's a mixed bag. A lot of people find it you know, to be a lot of different things. But it's nice to hear that a developer is uh, just as interested in the community as they are um, interested in their own project. And I think what you got going on right now is cool. And you've got a very you know, good mindset about getting it somewhere. You know, it's, it's mindfulness. If there's anything I can close out on this uh, interview, it's that mindfulness of your own project and being able to consider you know not only your own angle but other people's angles with like some sort of filter is incredibly important and you know just being able mm -hmm. to put yourself out there as like uh someone willing to listen and uh you know interact with the community that that speaks miles so it's cool when people like Serbillion exist and it's cool when they have cool <laughs> projects too that go with them you know because i've seen some projects that are <laughs> questionable at best but this is cool like i'm i'm excited to see whatever it is that you know sir ends up working on like down the line mm -hmm. and i would recommend using any opportunity you have to learn um if especially the, the game devs and whatnot um a, 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 as you mentioned earlier like don't be nervous about, you know, thinking you need to know everything when you start. You're, you're not going to know everything when you start. That's why you're a beginner. Um, yeah, exactly. There's plenty of things that you'll learn as you go along. Um, I will say, um, make sure when you do start not to make an MMO. Maybe make an <laughs> MMO once. Do that once and then learn quickly that that's hard. But, you know, find opportunities to... Um, to, to work on small things, maybe even with others. And a lot of these different things that you think you don't know now, you'll, you'll pick up. 
That's exactly what I'm saying. Be ambitious, but be mindful. And always consider that there are better options or maybe different options out there to help you along the way. And that's that's all it is. Just you know, be passionate, but you know, seek seek uh the process of being able to get stuff started because I know a lot of people out there have uh yet to find that inspiration. So just just feel good about what it is you do and care. <laughs> And make friends. Make definitely make friends. Reach out to game devs. Don't do it in a very like weird way, but reach out to a lot of indie game devs. Um, we're it's it's funny. Like uh, I I have so many dev friends that I just go, hey, I like your stuff. Um, cool. <laughs> and then we're just friends, right? And we just love to talk about you know how you know it's like making projects because I mean a lot of us have been working on things for a long time, and it's 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 fun and it's more comforting. But you can talk to people who are, are, you know, in your shoes or have been in your shoes. Um, so starting off by making yourself, you know, a small little network of, um, you know, game dev friends is really helpful as well as, you know, building an audience. Because um, a lot of times, you know, the audience will follow you as you grow and they're your, you know, they're your best friends or your best, uh, they, they will market your game for you. Um, it's, it, it's, it's a wonderful experience for both sides. Hella, hella. Uh, I guess with that. I'm gonna I'm say bye to you guys. It's been a it's been a blast. You want to say bye, Cerulean? Bye, everybody. Thanks for listening to me talk for an hour. Hope I wasn't that's boring. Like the, that's like the sweetest goodbye I've ever heard. All right, bye, guys. <laughs> <laughs>